8,000 years ago, the first humans set foot in Malta. Soon, they started carving these little statues. Some were genderless, some had gender and poise. They are made of inorganic material, limestone, right? They're crafted through human endeavor, through skill. And then these statues, they take a life of their own. They become organic, almost godlike. They provided inspiration, awareness, answers, symbolic well-being. Well, if you think about it, these statues are ancient artificial intelligence, right? 5,000 years old. Why? Well, because AI follows this same pattern. It starts off as an inorganic element, data, machine learning, power, data centers, and suddenly it functions like a real organic brain. It gives us answers. It inspires us. It's creative. And in some cases, AI becomes so human that you actually attribute gender and names to it. Yet, Unlike the slow passage of a thousand years over which these statues were carved, AI requires us today to readjust rapidly the speed with which we think about ourselves, about society, about public policy. Perhaps it's fair to say that we need to readjust the way we think about thinking. Originally, we thought of thinking as being a neurological function which happens in our brain. Yet today, thinking is something we do with the tools which are extended to our brain, to our arms, right? It's this fusion of human and machine. My own students often conflate and confuse their knowledge and their thinking with that available to the tools which they use and the speed at which technology is advancing in society is incredibly fast. Think about translation tools. It took us about 2,000 years to get from Malta's famous chippy stone, right? The inscribed languages in ancient Greek and Phoenician to our now AI-powered Google Translate. But radiology shifted so quickly in just 50 years from this image on the left to what we see now as visual radiology on the right. And we change the smartphones that we have in our pocket almost every year. And the one which you hold now is around a thousand times more powerful than the computer we used to land Apollo 11 on the moon in 1969. That's the speed in which we move today. Think about self-driving cars using artificial intelligence. It is now legal in most European countries, but only five years ago, this was utterly impossible. This is the speed of change. I think our children are probably going to be the last generation that need to actually learn how to drive. Just looking at the last 600 years of history, you could see how quickly we moved from Gutenberg's press all the way to the 3D chip now. We're doubling the speed of what we do every 18 months, right? That's reminiscent of Moore's law. So it took about 150 years to get through the industrial age, but it only took 65 years to get through the information age. And now, only 25 years to get to the innovation age that we just closed. So the rate of progress is really a function of the rate at which ideas can spread. And this is what technology is about. It's the method that ensures our connectedness. So in this fast-paced world, how do we ensure that the progress of technology actually improves well-being? How can we ensure that we know which impediments we need to remove and dismantle that hold back this progress? Well, here are my three proposals. First, we need to rip out bastions and walls. Well, at least metaphorically so. Bastions and borders, they constitute barriers, right? They prevent us in such a way from connecting with each other. They're almost this invisible method which keeps 
the both people out of mind. There's the inside and there's the outside. They give us this false sense of security, this sense of control, which I think we need to drop. So all border terminologies are ultimately just a mental construct. They're almost this insular siege mentality. They focus on these binary distinctions. And I think that in a fully connected digital world, borders must be recognized as a paradox. The emphasis needs to shift on what connects us, what makes us one, rather than what isolates us. To strengthen this nation, we need to go beyond walls and bastions. I think we need to build a culture which is anti-fragile, a culture that actually embraces dignified digital change and improves because of it. This resilience could become our new defining identity. The second concept that we should reframe today is the concept of watchtowers. They dominated Europe's coastlines for so many centuries, right? They're a method to raise an alarm when attack is coming from the sea. One could signal from one watchtower to the next in the 17th century, creating almost a wireless network of information nodes. But in an AI-driven world, how do we watch out for each other? You know, in a democracy which is now so eroded by misinformation, how do we protect journalists? Should we have AI tools that halt misinformation, that halt the perpetuation of threats in society? Should we perhaps suppress deep fakes, which AI is so good at creating? Should we ensure that recommendation engines should actually attract liability when they radicalize members within our society. And in the context of artificial intelligence, watching from the watchtower is all about psychological profiling. Actually, some artificial intelligence goes far beyond merely watching. Its aim is to actually change your attitude, your behavior, your choices, and we call this persuasive technology. It can predict your behavior and it can nudge your next action, perhaps recommend the purchase you should make, maybe even the choice of spouse or maybe your voting preference in the next elected government. And this is a problem because we are dividing citizens into two groups. The 99% us who are observed and the 1% in the watchtower who observe us all. Right? And this creates an asymmetry in power. It creates political inequality. I think this is the social stratification of our time. This is why I believe that we have a duty to encourage building technology on a solid moral foundation. And it starts with education. Because education gives us two key advantages. First, it informs us of the existence of persuasive technology, and it helps us recognize when this technology is being used to change our decision-making patterns. This is a unique opportunity for us, and I suggest that we should start with kids as young as age three to make sure that they can understand digital ethics and we can prepare them for a lifetime of digital interactions. The third idea for us to rethink is political theory. So if you look at society from a Marxist lens, you could sense this struggle between capital and labor. But AI is now the automated labor component. It's not human, it doesn't need a wage, it doesn't advocate for itself, it's certainly not unionized. And it's available at a marginal cost of zero, or almost zero, and probably AI is today ready to automate around 45% of the jobs in this country. Now, our present political rhetoric is so framed around jobs and job creation that even our national anthem asks God to grant wellness to the employee, now artificial intelligence, and benevolence to the employer. So, with the automation, of most jobs through artificial intelligence. Where does that leave us? 
How do we formulate economic policy that works? How do we broadly distribute the wealth that AI creates? How do we move to a society that understands that employability is less about what you already know and more about your ability to learn over time? And these three approaches, bastions, watchtowers and jobs, they cannot just be a function of politics, I think they are a function of culture, almost a new collective myth. And it's easy to see how Malta has grown around, away, and perhaps apart from most mythology. You know, the temples, the fat lady, divinity. Indeed, I think today there is almost an absence of an effective shared myth. Or perhaps technology is the new myth. Because as Arthur Clarke is famously quoted as saying, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So the myth of AI, it's weaved in philosophy, right? The belief that we humans can evolve beyond our current physical and mental limitations. And this is not a new idea. In 1949, a French Jesuit, Deschardins, proposed that machines would be linked one day into a global network, allowing the human minds to merge. He called this the intelligence explosion, the omega point, right? This idea of merging our minds with the divine. And we've taken this idea so much further. Kurzweil, well known for his work with Google, argues that we humans are merely made out of patterns. Patterns of identity, patterns of our thoughts, patterns of our memories, and all these patterns are contained in our physical hardware, our body that will one day soon give out, give away. So in theory, he argues that we can upload, we can transfer these patterns into a supercomputer that can exist independently after our body hardware fails. This is a new mythology, right? It's based on the old age religious principle of duality, of resurrection. And undoubtedly, this is going to create all kinds of philosophical anxieties. I think Europe is now going to need to struggle to reconcile that which is left of its Catholic identity with these new concepts in AI. And perhaps this takes us full circle to where we began, sculpture. Well, today, artificial intelligence is very much involved in creative processes. This statue, which you could see, is an AI sculpture which is aptly named Dio. Just like in human sculpture, it is inspired from thousands of other statues which the machine has learned from. Not only that, the actual sculpture is made from the shredded remains of the computer that actually designed it. So, can artificial intelligence be creative? Well, it's a useful question to ask because creativity is a derivative state of consciousness. So we want to explore this because we want to explore if AI can itself be conscious. Well, Alan Turing famously reduced the question of creativity to this. Can a computer surprise us? Well, I would argue that probably a computer can combine ideas, it can use them in new creative ways, and probably the Dio sculpture would pass that Turing test. So I believe that initiatives in artificial intelligence must ultimately focus on human rights, on human flourishing, a 2,000-year-old idea that Aristotle pushed under the title of eudaimonia, right? So AI must enrich and it must enable human endeavors. But to allow that to happen, we need a new framework, a framework which is built on trust. Clearly, we don't have broad societal acceptance which engenders trust, and we can't create trust by making AI simply better at what it does, it will only be trusted if there is a broad societal respect based on an ethical framework. Now, make no mistake, our island, our world, need to be technologically empowered. 
This means we need to find a way of using artificial intelligence as a vector of positive socio-political change. And it has to be centered on the interests of citizens, right? Our wellness, our dignity, our values. And technology, just like science, just like this 5,000-year-old statue, is a human endeavor. It is guided by human values. And the humanity and the fragility that you could see in this sculpture is a daily reminder to me that AI must be responsible. It must be ethical. It must be lawful. Its mythology must be human-centric and inclusive, but its outlook should have no bastions, should have no borders. So perhaps the key to success here is this. We need to focus our technology on what humans do best, creativity, empathy, and AI should be used as a method to enhance these abilities and never replace them or suppress them. I believe that the future belongs to those nations, to those individuals who could shape the power of AI, whilst maintaining this deep, dignified respect for the things that make us truly human, truly fragile, just like this 5,000-year-old statue. Thank you.